beautiful sunny day in Chicago today. We're in uh, Norwich, Illinois, just on the outskirts of Chicago on the west side, a suburb of Chicago, and uh, we're we're at the uh, Irving Park Cemetery. Across, there's another cemetery here called Arcacia. But this is where we're looking for little Debbie Fijan, which is a cold case that, I don't know, I, it'll, it'll blow your mind because it's really not a cold case. And I'll explain why. We're in. I have a general idea where Debbie's grave is. This is one of the, I'm going to say one of the more frustrating stories I've heard uh, as I look deeper and deeper into this tragedy of little Debbie Fijan. She was 10 years old when she was killed. And uh, she was stabbed 19 times and she was found on the side of, uh, in the ditch of the road with her school books and uh, other, art of, uh, other things she had from school. And oddly enough, she had a full mounted duck, a real mount, duck mount with feathers. It was a school project. I'm gonna probably guess it would be uh, a show and tell uh, a show and tell project and uh, but it was uh, this is I think one of the oldest cases cold cases and I'm, I'm gonna tell you it's not a cold case at all they let the killer walk free and when you hear what I'm gonna tell you I think you're gonna be equally astounded and frustrated I don't know how uh, how they convicted convicted any anyone back in the day. This was 1966 when this happened, and so she was last seen um, at 5:30 p.m. at the school, and she was with her teacher, who last saw her, who is the uh, is the prime suspect. We'll get into that. His name was uh, Lauren Schofield, and I think he was 27 years old at the time. And uh, this guy was—he uh, talks—he taught sixth and seventh grade, and he also taught—he he taught phys ed. And I think this guy was, well, maybe not a pedophile, but. Anyway, he, uh, he did a lot of odd things. You know, and, and, you know, he was the primary suspect because right off the bat, they go to his house and there's remnants of burnt clothing, fresh. There were feathers found in his car. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you some of this stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like, so, like, how do you get, a, how do you get away with this? Um, his clothes, which is his wife actually gave the clothes to authorities that he wore to the school that day, and they had blood on it, uh, blood on the clothes. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because you just, just wait till you hear this. It's not funny, but it's preposterous. He surrendered a small pocket knife and this uh, pornographic material he had. He had pornographic material in the desk of his, uh, in his school desk, teacher's desk. Now I can't say it was child pornography, but it was pornography and he burned it in the school incinerator and they found that. I mean, the investigative work was, was seemed to be really good. The police, listen, the police, they did a great job on this. And uh, he told his wife the day after the killing to burn lewd literature and pictures, which he had brought home. And he, listen to this, he, he said, oh, I, I found them on the side of the road and I thought it shouldn't fall in the hands of children. 
yeah, that's, uh, we're going to believe that. And a witness reported that uh, it was a husband of one of the teachers that he saw, you know, they were at the school, there was a, there was a basketball game going, there's a lot of stuff going on. And he reported that he saw a guy and a white car with a girl standing next to the car. And of course, what car did Schofield drive? I, he was one of three people, only three people in that area, that whole area that were uh, suspects that drove a white car. So, so the sheriff, his quote of the day was, we got our man. And you know what, he, they did. I think they did. I think most people did, do, did and do. And uh, the guy basically confessed. I mean, he told investigators that he, uh, he could have committed the murder, but he couldn't remember. <laughs> really? Come on. Okay, can't remember. I could have done it. He failed nine, I think it was nine lie detector tests. And he gave, you know, and we, we hear this in, on the stories, uh, inconsistencies, different stories told over and over means you are lying. And that's what he did. Different versions. And then he said, oh, I, I can't remember the place uh, you know, I couldn't remember where I was the evening of Debbie's disappearance. I don't know exactly where I was. And just on and on. And listen to this. Here, here's some, I'm just going to, there were, there, I read the, uh, the interview. They, they had publicly released the uh, Q&A. You know, today we see videotaped interviews. And none of that stuff gets on the, you know, boy, the, back in the 60s and the 70s, they would just... Uh, newspaper people had access. They could touch evidence, and and they can, they would release uh, a lot of information. So some of these questions, uh, for example, you know, how did you feel towards Debbie? I had mixed emotions. I felt resentment toward her, probably because she paid attention to my son. Oh, okay. And the guy goes, the the cop goes, can you explain that? Well, she was a very intelligent, smart girl, but she could be annoying. And uh, next question, there is a possibility that you've murdered this girl. Is that right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Sounds like a confession to me. I mean, what do you got to do? Could you absolutely deny that you murdered her? Uh, no, I can't absolutely deny it. Now, listen, these, these are like... This is right out of the newspaper, like what was, what was said. Why did you burn the literature in your desk in, your school, in the school? Uh, because I thought then if anything would come up from the situation, which progressively started to look worse and worse, I wouldn't want any suspicion on me. Boy, this guy sounds like, a, like an eight-year-old trying to get out of a lie, really. Why did you lie about the route you took home last Friday? Oh, uh, well, this was early in the investigation. I didn't want to get involved. So, you know, come on. And where I'm going with this is, uh, and, and, and by the way, the day after, I mean, you, you look at the parents, their life is just ruined. And the day after, the mom, Marilyn, she goes to the school to console the students. Gosh, what great people. Can you, could you imagine? Who would have the strength to do that? She did it. And then some really smooth hotshot attorney got involved, Mr. Smarty. His name was Robert Chapsky. He was from Elgin. Oh, he says, well, no, no, we're, we're stopping these interviews and lie detector tests. And, oh, you want to do a mental examination? No, we're not doing that. So he kind of just shut the whole, he shut the whole invest, investigation down. 
So here we are, and uh, I've got to do more investigation on this on the way out if I can get into the office. But from the research I did, uh, little Debbie's buried right here between, she's buried between this um, marker, this memorial, which is her mom's parents and uh, this tree. She's right here. Now, why she doesn't have a memorial stone? You know, you look back at one of my, I think my first video of Elsa, Elsie uh, Eliska, who was Perubek, who was murdered, not to get off track, but she had the headstone, her parents did not. And um, why, I mean, I, I don't understand this, but you know, maybe, maybe she isn't here. I think I'm, her parents moved to Florida and I looked up their, uh, I'll show here their markers. He, I think he fought in Korea. So you have, uh, you know, those type of memorial stones. Marilyn's parents which is Alma and Bert. Uh, Alma just died in 2014. Jensen. So what happened, what happened? Well, when the attorneys get involved and the judge sits there, the judge says, not enough evidence. Now, granted, they didn't have DNA. They didn't have uh, all the fancy blood testing. But come on, how do you let this guy go? Yeah, I'm gonna see if I can if I can find out whatever happened to him. I'll. I'm sure he uh, he disappeared or his family disappeared. And you know what happened was Marilyn. I, don't, I think it was a month later, she actually drove to their house because he got out on bond and then this whole case looked like it was slipping away. And she, the, uh, Lauren's wife, Schofield's wife came out and she told her, she said, if we ever see him on the street, he's gonna die. We're gonna kill him, you know, in no certain terms. She said it. And of course the wife goes running to the police and the newspapers. And uh, she said uh, when they got back to Maryland, she's like, I didn't say that. Good for her. <laughs> she said, if he, we ever see him on the streets, he's not going to get any of that money. And I think they were referring to, I don't know what they were referring to, some type of money he was going to make off this. Anyway, let's we'll see if we can find out what happened uh, to Mr. Lauren Schofield. But here I'm standing over the grave unmarked of little Debbie Fijan, 10 years old. And we hope, uh, we hope you're resting in peace, Debbie. Next up, the grave of the Gusenbergs. Now these guys were mobsters in the Capone days. Actually, they were enemies of Al Capone. And they were very, uh, they were very infamous, and uh, they worked for uh, they worked with Bugs Moran growing up, and they all joined the uh, Dion O'Banion gang, Northside Crew, the Irish, the guy that owned the flower shop who got assassinated there by the hitmen, and uh, I think they worked with Jaime Weiss also. Anyway, they were going after Capone. Here is their tomb or marker for their graves. Gusenberg. And I do not see, I see some money. I see a cross. Let's see if we've got names here on the other side. That interesting. Now we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of 
of space here, so I'm guessing they're, uh, Peter and Frank are here, the brothers. And, uh, you know, these guys, uh, Frank, man, he was the, he was the hit man. He was the top hit man. And what they did, they scared the heck out of Al Capone. They did the, uh, the gorilla of sh drive up, shoot him out. I mean, you watch the movies and the old Chicago typewriter, as it was called, the Thompson submachine gun with not the straight clip, but the drum barrel. They did that in grand fashion. And they did it at Capone's headquarters at the Hawthorne Hotel down at Cicero. And they riddled it. They riddled that place with bullets. And Capone was actually there cowering as uh, Peter came out with his Thompson and he just emptied that thing. He was, uh, they say he was uh, clad in a khaki armor shirt, uh, army shirt, brown overalls when he uh, took out his 100-round uh, capacity Thompson and uh, kneeling in front of the doorway, he just he emptied the entire drum into the restaurant. And then he uh, just casually strolled back in the car. And Capone, it shook Capone up. Al Capone immediately called for a meeting. And they, they had a meeting. Um, and they were trying to, you know, settle things down. But then uh, somebody hit Jaime Weiss. He got killed. Maybe we'll look him up sometime. So Jaime Weiss gets bumped, so that just set things off. So they were they were going back and forth. And uh, the Gusenbergs are probably most famed for being the victims in the St. Valentine's Day massacre, which happened on Clark Street and the Cartage Company. I forget the name of the Cartage Company. And uh, yeah, those uh, they were they're <laughs> they're in the pictures. And. Um, that was the end of them. And really, that was the, the Northside gang was weakening already. So that was kind of put a lot of closure. And that's how Al worked. He was in Florida. That was his alibi. I wasn't there. Al Capone at his Florida place. Smart guys. Ruthless guys. So anyway, that's the Gusenbergs. While we're here, we're going to have a visit with another victim of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And uh, with the Gusenbergs, he was a pal of the Gusenberg brothers, Bugs Moran, ran with the uh, Dion O'Banion gang, one of the top, uh, one of the top guys. His uh, name was Jim Clark. I mean, that was his street name. His real name was Albert Kachalek. He was born in Germany in 1887. And uh, we're gonna go look up his, uh, it's right up here. So uh, enemies of Al Capone, he was a victim of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and he worked closely with the Gusenbergs. So they, they further aggravated the situation uh, you know, with, uh, with the killing of, uh, well, it was an assassination of a, a guy named Patsy Lalordo, and he was a gangster working with Al Capone. And there were three of them. James Clark was leading it with the, with the Gusenbergs, those three guys. And, you know, they were working for Bugs Moran. Here it is. There's Albert. Uh, 1887, yep, 1929, and his uh, wife, Elma, she lived till 1970. Wow, can you imagine? So, then the, the Gusenbergs, they, uh, they went after Jack Machine Gun McGurn, and Capone said, uh, you know, those, those actually failed was Al Capone's hitman and Al Capone said I've had enough he uh, they came up with the plan for the uh, St. Valentine's Day massacre and uh, Albert was there 
I'll show a picture um, of that carnage. Uh, very famous, everyone's seen it. But a beautiful stone here that uh, that they have. Not so fast. We've got one more guy here that we need to uh, check out. And uh, boy, there's been a lot of destruction here at the cemetery. There must have been one heck of a storm that came through here. There's one other guy that was on the other side, on the Capone side, and he was uh, actually the one of the gunmen, or suspected, will always be a secret, of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre that killed the Gusenbergs and all those other... Bugs Moran, by the way, he, uh, he was the main target. He was kind of the boss of that crew. And he was coming down the street, and he saw some policemen, and he, he, he just boogied out of there. Actually, the policemen were mob guys from the Capone side dressed in disguise. They were the murderers, and one of those guys dressed as a cop possibly or probably was Fred Goetz, who was known on the street as Shotgun George Ziegler. And... There's a picture on Find a Grave site, if you go there, for this gentleman at Irving Park Cemetery, and all there is is a picture of what I matched up as the perimeter cemetery fencing here, and there's no location for the grave, and I went to the uh, office, and uh, they were very nice, but they would not disclose the location of this grave. So I was trying to look at that picture and I really, I drove the perimeter of the cemetery and I could not find those apartment buildings. So I don't know who or why or so a little, a little investigation would be helpful. But I thought it would be, well, he's here, he's, he's close by. Um, but uh, a little bit about him. Getz, he was a life. He started out as a lifeguard in 1922, way north at Beach, in Beach Park, uh, Illinois, a neighborhood. And, until he was charged with uh, sexually assaulting a seven-year-old whose name was Jean Lan Lambert. Uh oh. Uh, he was by an alley. So uh, this was at Edgewater. This is down by the lake on the north side, so he, uh, not surprisingly, jumped bail on that, and um, he found himself uh, joining the Barker gang, Ma Barker, and this, uh, of course, was after the St. Valentine's Day massacre, which we're not going to get into, but uh, yeah, he ran with the Barker gang, and uh, Alvin Karpus, Fred Barker, Doc Barker, and they were involved in the Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota uh, kidnapping of uh, Edward G. Brummer, which is a very famous case. And they released him. They got, I think they got a couple hundred grand out of that. But like all of these guys, or most of these guys, except for Al Capone, he... Uh, he met his end violently. He was killed by, in a drive-by shooting um, outside a closed uh, Cicero, Illinois restaurant called the Minerva. And that was on March 20th, 1934. So uh, he was, he didn't die right away, but he got to the hospital and then he died there. His expensive car was found uh, and it was believed to have been abandoned there by his wife, Irene. And uh, Fred, he was a wanted fugitive by the FBI. The culprit for his murder has never been caught, not known. But uh, a number of his former associates had mo uh, motives for his murder, including the Barker gang. So he... He did not leave the Barker gang on good terms, and Alvin Karpis 
believe that uh, actually the outfit boss, Frank Nitti. Now, Alvin Karpis was Barker Gang, but he, he was pointing the finger at Frank Nitti. That, uh, anyway, he's buried here in Norwich, Illinois at Irving Park Cemetery somewhere. Uh, if anyone can uh, sleuth, detective, figure it out, I'll be back here in a heartbeat and I'll get it all. But uh, I don't know if his real name's even on the tombstone. I, I, I of course, the, the people, descendants, etc. They don't want him. Uh, they don't want him to be found. And by the way, uh, back to Debbie's. Uh, that was the same thing. That's a private. They don't want it marked. They don't want people there. Um, probably because of all the publicity back in the day, uh, in the first years after her death. So uh, they told me that's why her, she does not have a monument, but she is there but, uh, next to her grandparents. And uh, her folks, her folks are in Florida. So that's the uh, story. Antonio, Antonio J. Bonilla, Bonilla. Antonio, okay, we're going to try this again. Antonio J. Bonilla. He was born in uh, November of 1994, and he died uh, February 2nd, 2015. He was a beloved son. He was a loving father, cherished brother. This is a really sad story, guys. Um, Antonio uh, fell in love with, uh, well, his father describes her as an evil woman. I don't know if she was evil, but anyway. He was in love with her, and apparently her family would not accept him because he was Hispanic, and they were white, and they told her, don't date this guy because he's, he's beneath you, his race. They must have been racists. And uh, sad to say, this is still going on. I mean, I gotta tell you something. Um, I, I, the way I feel, I'm, I'm not a racist, and I actually look up to, like for example, Hispanic people. I think that they have family values, they work hard. They, uh, it's all positive stuff. They're good people. And I think they're better. I think they're better than that family. They, uh, they had a gift. And uh, this boy hung himself on their porch, on their back porch while he was crying for her. And they were all in the house, all in the house locked the door, cowering, while Antonio was choking. They heard him choking, and uh, they just did nothing. And he had been texting, I guess this relates to uh, suicide prevention. I mean, in the end, you can't, you can try to prevent it, but... Look at this. Oh my gosh, there's a progression of Antonio since he was little. What a, what a great looking guy. And uh, multiple friends knew that he was going to do this and she knew it and her parents knew it as he had sent several texts what he was going to do and where he was going to do it and nobody did anything. One friend from out of state tried to save him, tried to do something, intervene, but he wasn't here. And everybody else did nothing. And so this young man, he killed himself. And shame on whoever she is. If this is true, again, I'm hearing just one side, who knows, but if it's true, shame on them. This boy is lost, uh, but 
maybe not he's in a better place right now uh, he obviously was into a lot of things from the Blackhawks and the Bears and boxing and music and uh, he's free as it says here so rest in peace Antonio leaving the uh, Irving Park Cemetery and right across the street I'm going to do a quick stop at the Arcacia Cemetery where there's one more grave I would like to uh, I'd like to see and we got a little traffic jam here let's go guys and we're here Arcacia Park We're in. Looking for the grave of Johann Siegfried Andersen, who was born in Finland and he was a World War I hero. And I'm looking at these American flags and I'm looking for him and look at this. He doesn't even have a flag. Oh, but his wife does. Okay, that counts. Here it is. First Sergeant, 132nd Infantry, 33rd Division, World War I. He died in 1950. Uh, you know, this is, this is pretty notable. Uh, his wife died 38 years later. So what did he do? What did, what did Johans do? Well... He uh, was with his company and he was being held up by intense artillery and machine gun fire. So what did he do? Well, without aid, he voluntarily, didn't ask the captain or nothing, he just, uh, he just voluntarily left and uh, headed out on his own. And uh, he worked his way up to the rear of the, this machine gun nest, which was shooting it was just totally had him pinned down off, off uh, it was just a lot of resistance it, it was kind of a key position he couldn't get uh couldn't get around and uh he uh, went behind the nest and he went through actually through an open area and they were firing at him the whole time he had nothing to hide behind but he made it and he did silence the gun and captured it and not only that he brought 23 uh, prisoners back, so uh, he got the Medal of Honor in 1919. Pretty impressive. Thank you for your service, Johannes Anderson. You're a brave guy. Hope you're resting in peace. Uh, I have to tell you, this cemetery is the cemetery of what I'm going to call everybody's equal. There is not one tombstone that is bigger than the rest. They all have different, um, they have a different, different feel, different design, but uh, different granites and such, but every single one is the, uh, is the same size as you look in the distance. It's almost like, uh, Reminds me of Arlington Cemetery in a different way. Hey, have you ever heard of the Harlem Globetrotters? That's right, Abe Saperstein. He was the man. And he is right here. Basketball coach, manager. Abe was born in London, England. I see a penny there. He died in 1966. And uh, he's the first guy that organized an African-American basketball team. They were originally called the Savoy Five in 1926. And uh, then they changed it to the uh, Harlem Globetrotters. Razzle Dazzle, they were fun to watch. Um, this guy was an innovator. And uh, what else can I say about Abe and the 
Harlem Globetrotters. That'll wrap it up, folks. See you on the next one.